Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Coffee Shop Philosophy. As always, I'm your host, Killian Hobbs, the news editor for the Being Libertarian family of publications, as well as the managing editor for think-liberty.com specifically. As always, you can follow us on all forms of social media. You can listen to our podcasts wherever you get your podcasts, including uh, our YouTube channels and everything else. Uh, you can follow me personally at Killian Hobbs Author on Facebook. And if you do have any questions about the show or if you actually follow any of my writings, then, of course, you can connect to me through there. Today's episode, I'm going to dive right in. Also, I want to do I do want to congratulate myself a little bit here because I think that's the shortest I've gotten the intro. I've been trying to narrow it down week after week after week. And I think getting it in that like 15 seconds is probably the best that I've done it so far. So I'm going to probably just steal that audio and use it over and over again because I don't think I'm going to do it better than that. Um, no, I'm not going to actually do that because that sounds pretty terrible to just have that sound clip leading it every time. But anyway, it's all about the learning experience, I guess you could say, which kind of brings us into the episode today. Uh, similar to uh, about two episodes when I was talking about um, social engineering and stuff like that when I had my guest Jody on here. Uh, we're going to be diving into more of the specifics on the education system itself, uh, some of the, the pros, the cons, things that are going on in the schools that are um, problematic to use an overused phrase, uh, some of the alternatives that exists and how those approaches work, so on and so forth. We're going to just let the conversation kind of evolve and go from there. Uh, I do have another guest on this week. I wanted to introduce Victoria Smith. Victoria, how are you doing today? I'm doing well. That's good to hear. That's good to hear. Uh, so Victoria, she's been in the education system for how many years have you been there? I would say by a total of 15 to 20 years. 15 to 20 years. And that was as a uh, public school teacher, I think you said earlier. Now, I think when we were talking earlier, you had mentioned that um, you did some public and some private. That is correct. Yeah, I did a uh, school and I was there for about 13, 14 years. And then had kids, stayed home with them, and then dropped back into teaching. But I knew when I left public school, I could never go back. <laughs> and uh, I know, it's that bad. And, uh, and so I found a job in a private school. So that's what I've been currently doing this year. I started in uh, August of this year. Oh, that's good. That's good. Mm -hmm. Um, I guess the biggest question out of that then would be, <laughs> and I have a feeling this is going to be the next like 20 minutes of this episode. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to ask a really broad question here. When you said you can't go back to the public system, what are the biggest issues in the public school system right now that you would say really catch your attention on that? Uh, I guess we'll, I guess we'll break it up a bit because, just asking a broad question, what's wrong with our public education system? We right. could probably be here for like five hours talking about all the shit that's going on with the kids these days. Right. You know, I always uh, feel bad when I say the kids these days because I know I'm not actually old enough to throw that phrase around, but it just seems so apt. Uh, but no, um, as I was saying there, let's start off. What are the kids themselves facing I guess you could say in a public school system or just in the school ages these days that you would say are the, the primary issues that need to be addressed that just aren't. Um, the idea it's a one size fits all like these kids, they all go in the same grade and they're learning the same material at the same pace. And that's what's hurting our kids. Because even as public school, school teacher does try to differentiate and scaffold all those come words that, you know, administrators like to hear, it's impossible to do it with 20, 24 kids. And you really can't do it effectively. And I've tried, you know, I, you know, it's, I tried, but uh, it all comes down to it's one size fits all, but they tell us to, you know, differentiate the test. Is not different. So if I'm teaching a kid on grade level, then what's going to happen when they take the state test? Now, that wouldn't be a big deal if administration wasn't breathing down our necks about the tests because the districts get money for how well students do. 
And so what ends up happening is a lot of teachers just teaching to the test. Mm. And that and that means kids get a worksheet with a short passage. And if the kid can't read, then uh, they're not going to pass. And what happens is they or the teachers, we end up teaching strategies. And these strategies are very elaborate. It's circle this, cross out this. And so that's what teachers spend their time teaching is this test. And that hurts. And it's boring. It's so boring. Yeah, no, I hear uh, you on that one. Yeah. And and it's hard because I always rebelled against it when I was a teacher. I mean, to be honest with you, I don't think there was a single principal that really liked me. <laughs> but and I'm not kidding. But like, I wouldn't get in trouble because, first of all, my kids were well behaved. And second, they end up passing the test. And if not passing the test, they were so close. I would refuse to do all those assessments and I would just teach authentically. And, and see, that's, yeah, that's a very important aspect right there that I don't think that the education system in general has a lot of. No. I mean, I'll I'll give a personal example here. When I was uh, when I was a lot younger, um, as I mentioned in previous episodes of this course, I was originally homeschooled. The, mm-hmm. the reason for that was they did the initial assessment um, They took the, they went to the school. We went through the in, initial assessments for, uh, for going into the schools here. And the, the principal that was at the school, uh, I forget her name. I wish I could remember it, but uh, the principal at the school had basically said, this isn't going to work for your kid. Now, normally that would be a case. And I always feel like I have to preface this because I find there's no way to explain this without sounding like an egotistical ass. There's just, <laughs> there's just no way to explain it without, at least in my eyes, sounding like an asshole. Um, but basically what they said was you are not... You're not going to have a a positive experience putting your kid in the normal age bracket. We can bump your kid up grades uh, because I would have qualified for, I think, grade two or grade three when they were originally looking at me. I think it was grade three, but I would have been around grade one at the uh, age wise at the time. Right. Um, But basically they said we can put him ahead and then he's going to have problems because he's surrounded by people that are bigger and older than him. We could put him in the same grade. And then he's going to have he's going to have problems because he's going to be bored out of his mind because our system just isn't designed for that. And frankly speaking, you can't afford to put him in anything special because the only money that comes from the government or anything like that for special needs, for the most part, is those with restrictions as far as special needs are concerned. There's not a lot as far as gifted or anything like that's concerned. I mean, I never really like the term gifted. As far as describing what I was, because, again, I I think I always go off of that. um, I always go off of that uh, Stephen Hawking line. People who talk about IQs are losers. Uh, (laughs) It's the same thing with just intellect in general. It's like prove what you're prove what you got through what you're saying and through general conversation and learn for the sake of learning all that sort of stuff. But if you're just going to go around saying I am so smart, SMRT then fuck off. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's all I can really say at that point. But yeah, I know it was, um, it was a, the same issue and that would have been early nineties is mm-hmm. the same issue that you're talking about that actually led to me being homeschooled, which was the fact that our systems designed around cookie cutter results. It's mm-hmm. not about mm-hmm. fostering what a specific student is capable of, or even their areas of interest or areas that they excel in that, you know, at a young age, they might be really into it and it could be a really bright future for them. And then as they get older, when they've been through the quote unquote, I guess you could say meat grinder Mm -hmm. until they get into high school where they can start picking courses here and there, in which case they find out that some of those talents have just been lost. Yeah. And it's, It's the cookie cutter approach, you know, that separates education from knowledge I've always found. Absolutely. Yeah. And and that's what would happen. And that's what did happen. And I think there was a turning point and it was uh, 
they were taking the tech test, which now Texas has the star test. But, um, and I was walking around and one student, you know, struggled, you know, sweet girl. She just wasn't at the grade level. And I remember getting mad because she wasn't getting the question correct. And that's when I realized, I was like, what is happening to me? I was like, I'm not, I'm not a teacher anymore. I'm, I'm a proctor. And that, I don't know, that really, and, you know, things didn't change until, you know, of course, I think about, I want to say about two years later, that's when, you know, I got pregnant and I quit teaching. But, um, but yeah, like that was just a really gross feeling for me. And yeah, the, I, I would get that. That was kind of like a completely unrelated, but uh, quite a few years ago, I used to do collections. Mm -hmm. And when I got into it, you know, I was still pretty, uh, I guess you could say human about the job. Yeah. Like it was one of those people owe money. It's a thing that needs to be dealt with. My job was to call them, tell them they owe the money, explain what happens if they don't pay it, and then explain how they can pay it and try to set everything up. Yeah. But then I would get to a point where it was just like, I started hearing about people with, you know, fixed incomes and stuff like that. And I'd say, yeah, I've got a salary. I'm on a fixed income too. I don't really care. And then I yeah. kind of caught myself on it. I'm like, this isn't the person I want to be. Right. Why am I letting a job do that to me? It completely gets rid of any positive that I thought I could find in this kind of role. Right. Not that there's much positive to find in being a debt collector, but. <laughs> but there is compassion. Yeah. yeah, you can you can talk to people and I would mm -hmm. assume and I got to assume because I've never done the job myself like I've done I've done business training where I've had quote unquote students. But yeah, that's a that's adult education. And I'm with them for like a couple of days just to make sure yeah. they're in the right place. It's not the same as having a class for, you know, a semester or two semesters or even multiple years. If I teach if you're teaching multiple like, me in English, not friends. <laughs> If you're teaching multiple <laughs> grades, it's my mistake right. for trying to use words with more than one syllable. syllable. <laughs> After like three minutes ago, I talk about being gifted. <laughs> and this is why you don't talk about intelligence. Because uh -huh. it means nothing if you can't communicate it. <laughs> but uh, no, as I was saying there, it, I would assume that it's a completely different animal as far as the education field is concerned because you're there with the kids and that's kids they're right? kids they're just I kids know. and you're there with them day in day out trying to help them out there yeah. and then you also have almost job expectations that don't always match what you need to do with the kids exactly that's yeah that's exactly right you know and i would try when i was in the classroom to you know, choose novels or choose books or do activities that would pique their interests. But, you know, again, I have 24 kids. You know, I'd love to have been able to um, plan for each individual one, but you just, there's no time. There's barely enough time uh, to plan for the day. Yeah. And so, and, and, and another thing, because we had to spend so much time on the test mm -hmm. and passing the test that, Things like social studies and science got kicked to the side. Um, art class was dedicated to the star test or the tax test. And uh, science got kicked to the side. Yeah. Science. Yeah. The, the, oh, the field that teaches people how our world actually works. Yeah. 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 It was, it's bad. <laughs> what would you say I, if we're talking about things that are bad? Since this is obviously a libertarian podcast, you know, I have to ask this right. question. How much of it is the government fucking that up? <laughs> yeah. yeah um, I feel like I asked a dangerous question with that <laughs> laugh. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I'm in the States here because, you know, deep down, I've always been anarchist and libertarian. I've always had that rebellion in me and it showed in my teaching. And um, but yeah, I really think it was it was a way for us to really like educate the kids. But yet yeah, the concern is that a lot of your other curriculum, like science and social studies was pushed to the side. Um, I, you know, I was teaching at a, in the inner city, it was a title, it was a title one district, which means that the majority of the kids are on free and re reduced lunch. Majority of the kids are at risk. 
And so a lot of these kids are just coming in with a lot more than, let's say, your kids in the suburbs. And so that's where this push for passing this test, because we got to, you know, we got to get the government funding and um, every, everything was spent on test prep. Mm -hmm. And and then, in fact, I rebelled or I didn't rebel. I was just kind of an asshole about it. <laughs> so when when I would do my lesson plans, like I wouldn't even lesson plan for Friday and I would just write assessment Friday. Yay. Under each um, subject assessment Friday. Yay. Math <laughs> assessment Friday. Yay. And like I said, my principals didn't like me, but um, but I mean, that's what that's what we did. So right there, four days were only spent on teaching. And then, of course, there would be this random fluency test or this or that. And what, what I what was so aggravating is that, OK, I would do this fluency test and I would turn in the like I would have to put the results in on the computer. But did anyone come to my door later and said, hey, I noticed that Johnny is not doing well. How can we help you? Can we pull Johnny? No. All it was just was collecting data and nothing change. So I'm like, why am I spending a whole period and a whole hour doing this fluency test on these kids? I already know how they're reading. I read with them every day. And so that was frustrating. But yeah. um, but but things like that just happened all the time. You know, all of a sudden Monday it was this like, I can't even remember. Uh, I know fluency was a big one. Oh gosh. Then they like we we had to do this like poetry thing and and like the reading specialists would make us do this poem and I'm like okay you know once again you're taking this instruction away from just authentic teaching and I mean I guess I know why they do it because there's a lot of teachers that are there for five and twenty we call them five and twenty teachers because that's when we got paid so they were just there mm. and. And it's hard. You can't fire a teacher. And 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 it's unfortunately it's like it's it's those kind of teachers that ruin it for the rest of us. And, you know, and I, I'm not here and I'm not bashing teachers at all. I, I don't want this to be I don't want anyone to think that because I have a lot of respect for teachers and I usually defend them when a lot of libertarians call them welfare whores. Never but, got that rhetoric. Oh, uh, yeah, it's, it bothers me because they obviously never been a teacher. And it's um, also like the job would exist, whether it's the state paying for it or anyone else. Yeah, like even if you, shit. it's like the, yeah. the military. If you got right. rid of the military, as far as the state's concerned, there would still be a group of guys that we would pay to defend mm -hmm. collective borders right. on our behalfs. It's right the job would still exist whether there's a state doing it or not. And it's still a job that we cherish. Yeah. Exactly. It's why the majority of people still support it simply because it's a feature of society that we would want. We just don't want the state doing it, but that doesn't make the people doing the job any worse, nor yeah. does it make the job itself any less important. Exactly. It doesn't apply yeah. to everything the government does. Of course, in right. fact, not even the majority of it. But yeah. there's quite a few, few things that are, you know, it's necessary. Mm -hmm. And I think the education of the youth kind of ranks up there. Just, yeah, a, no just my personal opinion on that. <laughs> but, but going off of that, though. Yeah. Because um, as we had on the episode two weeks ago, because we talked about education there as well. Mm -hmm. uh, not to hark back to that episode too many times, but. No, that's fine. Um. In that episode, we did talk about the social engineering side. And I think right. when you talk about the, the standardization of testing and the standardization mm -hmm. of education and how everything in the school kind of had to kind of had to be directed less towards the actual welfare and education of the children and more towards the passing of these tests, you know, Correct. from because I was from kind of the social engineering aspect there. Mm hmm. What would you say is the impact that we see on people with that type of education system where they're not getting the personalized help because of the excessively large class sizes? They're mm -hmm. not getting the, 
you know, you're not getting actual education, education. They're getting, you know, a systemized training, if you will, to accomplish a test, Mm -hmm. which I would consider education and training to be two completely different elements. Mm -hmm. It's why the skills required to be a trainer versus being a teacher are almost polar opposites of each other as far as just education in general is concerned. Right. But what would you say is the is the impact of doing this to these kids? Yeah. Um, well, it, if the kid's doing all right, you know, they might get nervous. They might have test anxiety. Um, but it really affects the kids that are not there that probably won't pass. And they already, yeah, they're already, they already hate school. Um, and then if you have the kids that are perfectionists, that, you know, oh, I have to do well on this test. I have to pass, blah, blah, blah. I mean, it just creates this anxiety for them. Mm-hmm. And and I, I saw that a lot. I saw the extremes. I saw the kids that they didn't give a shit. And they would just, like, pick random bubbles because they knew they weren't going to pass anyway. And then you had the kids that were fretting over the test when I'm just like, relax. You know this. You can do this. But they get themselves so worked up mm-hmm. that they panic. Um, and again, kind of like what we mentioned earlier is that kids don't give a shit about school. School's boring. Mm-hmm. They don't, you know, a teacher slaps a worksheet in front of them and it just sucks the life out of them. It's, we're not creating lifelong learners when this happens. And I was going to ask like post school, what's the kind of impact that this leads to? Oh yeah. It, it, yeah. If they even get all the way through, you know, a lot of kids quit. But then when a lot of these kids get into high school and let's say they were always doing well, they were always passing. Now they're just pumping. Oh, you have to pass your SAT. You have to you know, get into a good college. I think I want to say the latest thing that I read on the CDC is that in the year 2020, which is next year, mental illness is going to surpass any sort of physical disability. And yeah, there's a couple of articles. I, of course, you know, I tried to find the research-based articles, and of course, you know, I can't find them now. But Psychology Today um, did an article about the danger of back to school, um, and then the news and features from the National Education Association (NEA) Today they did an article about the epidemic of anxiety among today's students, and then there was, of course. Uh, uh, then there's Michael Strong. He also harps on the idea that the this this pushing of excellence in these tests are driving kids over the edge. And then I'm sure, have you listened to or read The Coddling of the American Mind? Have you listened to that one yet? I've heard of it. It's come up actually yeah. quite a bit. Um, I yeah, have, it's, if I have the ebook, uh, yeah, I've got a couple books it. in my reading list that are ahead of it. Uh, okay. I think I'm about, I got four books that I want to finish before I dive into that one, just because the kind of the order I've set them up in. Sure, but sure. I've been meaning but to good. dive I'm glad, I'm glad it's on your list. But yeah, so, you know, in, in studies back, even like when I was in high school, back in the mid nineties, you know, there was always that if a, if a child feels connected with their school, they will be successful. And they're finding that the disconnection is getting greater and greater. Um, um, about right now, currently about 44% of the students are saying that they're happy. So that's leaving what 56% of kids that are miserable at school. And um, that's, that's just, that number is just too high. I mean, it's, kids should not be means, miserable about learning. That's right. Exactly. And that's the thing you're not learning though. No. You're... Oh, I, oh my gosh. I had, this is an anecdotal. Um, now I work at a private school, but I work part time and I, I homeschool my kids on Monday, Tuesday. I'm sorry, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, whatever. Um, but anyway, so it was like the day before school and I was at the grocery store and I was shopping and oh, I was bu- I was buying stuff like markers and stuff. because It was all marked down at this point because people already finished their school shopping. And this little girl who's checking me out, she's like, oh, you going back to school tomorrow? And I was like, no, you know, we homeschool, yada, yada, yada. And, you know, she's talking about how lucky she is. And then the and then the little bagger boy, he goes, um, he's like, I can't wait because I'm a senior and now I'll finally get to learn. 
like that, like kids are looking forward to their senior year because there's no more tests after that. And he said, so I can finally learn. Oof. Yeah. I was like, man, you're with senior year. I was, I was just flabbergasted. And like, and then like when he said that, I was like, okay, I know I'm making the right decision for my kids. You know, that's a heart dropping moment right there. That's just, sure that was. a very dark picture in my mind anyway, <laughs> yeah. that actual learning, actual <laughs> obtaining of knowledge mm-hmm. takes that long to get to. Yeah. That's, that's absolutely frightening. It's horrible. Uh, I guess, I guess, uh, cause we're kind of getting towards the end of the episode here. Oh, One man. last thing I want to ask you about, actually, because this is the part that I find a little more interesting. Well, I shouldn't say a little more interesting, but I definitely find it interesting itself. It's not more interesting, but it's something I personally would like to know more on mm-hmm. is what would you say are the key differences as far as the public education system, which you worked in for about the 13 years that you said there mm-hmm. versus the private system that you're working in now? <laughs> Um, well, you know what? It depends on the private school. And the problem is, is what's happening is a lot of these private schools, in order for them to lure students in, they, they are trying to be accredited by the state. And what happens is once they start going through that accreditation, they start losing what's amazing about it. Exactly. Now there's a few schools, like the school I work in, um, it's private and, but What's about this special about this school? It's one on one, and so um, like these kids. I mean, when I lesson plan, I am lesson planning for that that student. So that's an amazing setup. Now that's financially that's not really available for <laughs> the public. It's it's a very pricey school, um, but there are others out there, and there's another one that I really like. It's um, the Sudbury School. It's like, it's like a model of, it's just, it's almost like unschool. And these kids just go and they have complete agency of themselves. And if they want to play video games all day, they can. Um, and it's mixed ages. There's five-year-olds and high schoolers. And when I've read about it, when I first read about this school, I was like, okay, yeah, right. If I sent my kid to this school, she would just play roadblocks all day. But when you, I went to one of their little open houses and I went to one of their open houses and I mean, these, these kids are brilliant. I mean, these kids are just like a little five-year-old was talking to me about like their interests and it's like, okay, this is, this is really good. And, and it makes me think like back, you know, ages ago, there wasn't public school and we have amazing things like, you know, Galileo, you know, finding the planets and we have it asked backwards. It's Mm -hmm. we, I don't know. And I'm uh, yeah. No, I get what you're saying. It's like (laughs) we had the Renaissance, we had ancient Greek philosophers. We had uh, the intellectual revolution that took place alongside the industrial revolution, where the majority of what's considered modern philosophical thought you know that 1800s to early 1900s range we had all of those things come out of that and then we started to try to standardize education to replicate that but by trying to replicate it we lost the magic that made that happen yeah it's the it's the individualism of i guess the, the the cultivation of interest that really lends itself to that kind of genius that no offense to the modern thinkers we don't yeah. truly have anymore a lot yeah. of because I, I do read into you know a decent amount of modern philosophy modern uh mm-hmm. economics different things like that and a lot right. of the quote-unquote leading minds of today i find that they take today's problems and apply their own spin on the thoughts that people 200 years ago had Right. We're not seeing like a true evolution of thought. We're not tra- mm-hmm. We're not seeing massive breakthroughs as far as observations or thinking or anything like that's concerned. We're just seeing, okay, here's the solution this person pulled out of their ass because they had that kind of genius. And mm-hmm. here's my modern problem. 
I'm going to throw this solution at my modern problem. Hey, look, it works except for this has to be tweaked. All of a sudden, I'm considered a new genius. And that's yeah. that's not how it should work. But yeah. we don't we don't have that kind of we don't have that kind of an agency with our education these days, at least in my mind, from what I've seen. No. That seems to be pretty consistent regardless of who I talk to on the subject, is that the kids the kids don't get enough. They don't get what they need. Mm-mm. And I mean, sometimes, you know, it's not entirely education system. In some cases, you know, it's, say, too much or too little discipline in from the parental side or a lack of interest from the parental side. I'm not going to pen everything on the education system there because yeah. it takes more than just one institution to guarantee that the child's going to develop properly. Right. But at the same time, it seems like multiple critical system failures in a lot of cases. And this is kind of how we end up with this generic human being as a result. Right. Like we look at uh, my generation, my generation is considered the millennials and you hear a trope, a trope about millennials and it applies to too damn many of them. <laughs> <laughs> like a frightening amount of human beings born in that relatively small time window. Mm-hmm. And so many of these traits apply to them, despite the different areas they grew up, different areas of interest, different things that they experienced that led to their development, so on and so forth. And yet, I personally can name eight people that love avocado toast. <laughs> And obsess over it or obsess over craft beers. Oh, God. And the man bun? I I know three people with those. Yeah. Two now because one of them realized it was stupid. But, <laughs> yeah, that's a – and everyone else that doesn't have the man bun has that stupid fucking fade cut. <laughs> and I think, I think when we're talking about after effects, when we're – standardizing the education and we're standardizing the way that people learn and develop and grow, that's just going to lead to standardized people. Mm -hmm. And, you know, not to throw a Stepford, a Stepford wives conspiracy theory out there, but that's damn near dangerous. Yeah. Cause they can't think for themselves. And I want, I, I must say though, as far as like my experience with public school, and private school. So I've taught the extreme. I've taught kids that were probably living in a car to kids that live in mansions in downtown Houston. And, you know, they both have the same problems, whether it's, you know, a parent that's not around because either one is just gone or the other one's working or drunk or whatever the case might be. Um, they're missing that. But I have to say the kids that are, I don't know, coming from the inner city just seems they seem to have it a bit better. Like they have their head screwed on tighter. And I don't know if it's because they've just kind of given up or they're maybe they, because they hated school so much, they, you know, started to think for themselves. I I don't know. I don't know where I was going with that, but (laughs) I guess, I guess I was just, you know, just like comparing, contrasting the, the two extremes. And I don't know, these poor kids. Yeah. Um, But anyways, but yeah, as far as like with the, what the school's doing to the mental illness of our kids, um, high anxiety, hating school. And, you know, I don't know how it is in Canada, but the high schools here down in Texas and outside of Houston, they are humongous huge schools like you would drive by and you would think it was a college campus and so you're cramming 4,000 5,000 kids into these into this institution of learning and it's cookie cutter it's it's so standard and and the kids that are making it well you know a lot of them have high anxiety I know my nephew is up there you know he was and he went to a private school he was anxious you know, I have to study for the SAT. I have to get into a good college. 
I'm like, when does it end? Because then he's going to get into this college, which he was accepted into. He got into the college he wanted and the anxiety is going to start all over again. Unfortunately, you know, that's, that's just kind of the place, I guess, that this has left people in. Yeah. That said, though, you know, it's not all negative. Not all. Because yeah. like any problem, once you can understand it, once you can address it, there's things you can do to correct it. So like yeah. we said, with you um, homeschooling your kids on the three days a week, uh, my history having been homeschooled before, uh, mm-hmm. private options that offer a little bit better if you're able to afford that. Um, there's options out there that I think we could use to kind of cultivate that and kind of bring out those those better traits right? rather than and, relying entirely on the standard education system. And here in Texas, as of today, it might change with this new uh, legislative body, but uh, we have school choice and like, I don't have to answer to the state. I don't have to tell the state anything about my kids. Now the state is trying to get their dirty little paws into my homeschool classroom. And, and I think that's, there's, I, and I know why there's the big push to do that because a lot of people are opting out. Co-ops around here are starting to pop up. I'm trying to start my own school and cause people are fed up. You know, they, you know, a lot of people, a lot of people around here start pulling their kids out in third and fourth grade. Cause that's when they start with the standardized testing. And, um, and I just, I just hope, I hope Texas doesn't lose their school choice freedom. But, you know, once that, I don't know, the government will have their way no matter what. But yeah, hopefully that's not the case, though. That's definitely something we'll have to keep an eye on going forward in the future. Yeah. Uh, so just to just to wrap everything up here, um, it was a pleasure having you on going through everything and going into this kind of more in-depth knowledge on how the system operates and some of the things that have been going on there. I especially find the standardization and mental health aspects to be very interesting as far as what it's doing, as far as people's development and the like is concerned. Um, But again, thank you for coming on Uh, for everyone out there listening. uh, If you go back to about, I think it was the 14 or 15 minute mark, There was a couple different studies that were mentioned. Definitely go out and read those. There's a lot of interesting information there, I'm sure. I know I'm going to be reading that shortly after I'm done recording here. Again, you can follow us on all forms of social media. Uh, That's Being Libertarian, Rational Standard, or Think Liberty. Uh, Listen to our podcasts wherever you get your podcasts. And as always, if you liked what you heard and you'd like to hear more, I'll see you again next week.